Good morning and welcome back to Jack's Coffee Break. We are going to be talking about doing zoo layouts and uh, how to plan out a zoo um, and if you should even bother planning out a zoo a little bit. Um, and so to that extent, uh, for me, the new pack coming out is going to be the Eurasia pack. Um, so I want to plan something out that might be fun for all of the animals that we're going to have, as well as some of the animals that are available already in the game for uh, just the general region of Europe. Um, so we have this list right here. You'll notice that a lot of them are like butterflies, and um, we've got reindeer, timber wolf, uh, scarab beetles. I'm going to be focusing entirely on just the habitat animals, not the exhibit ones, uh, because they don't... You don't really build for exhibit animals, they build for themselves and then you plan around it. So we're going to exclude a few, like we're going to exclude uh, African pre uh, Crested Porcupine. We're not going to add gray seals, no flamingos. And the main reason why is because for the Eurasia pack I want to focus on Eurasia. Um, and so to that extent I think if we're going to do a zoo anywhere, Slovenia kind of seems like the place to do it. And to that extent I've loaded up this map right here. So you have access to this map. It is the European Taiga or Temperate map. Um, I believe it's the European Sculpted Temperate map. And if this looks at all familiar, um, this is because this is the map that we got the uh, the Twilight DLC's uh, campaign map. This is what that is based off of right here. Uh, so there would be a castle up here and then you'd have this massive jaunt all the way down which you can kind of see the outline for where those steps would have gone and then you would come into the park down here this is that map completely cleaned up and there's a, you'll notice a few things there's a good reason it's under sculpted it is not flat it's not even a little bit flat and most of the zoos you know that we plan out they're they're flat already they're you know that's normally what we start with. Uh, you have to go out of your way to start with a sculpted map, either by selecting from the download, uh, the the download, or downloading a TIF file, or by doing it yourself. Uh, this is one of those few maps in the game where it is already sculpted to look like a natural landscape. Uh, of course, the only exception to this is the flat map for the Oceana Desert. It is one degree off. And I'm going to continue to tell everybody on this planet that it is one degree off center until Frontier fixes it. And if they never fix it, I hope that somebody does it in a mod somehow. I don't even know how you would fix that in a mod uh, because it drives me up a wall. But if you want like a little bit of a, oh, that's a weird challenge, that's a good one to do it. So we have this absolutely massive map. I mean, truly huge. I think there are a few there, mm, the the Asia temperate map might also be enormous, but I mean this thing is it's just ridiculous. Yeah, here's our world border. So we've got a lot of space and arguably too much. I, I don't think that we're going to use all of this, but on the other hand what it does is it allows us to build big. Um, and so that's something that I really want to consider. So let's go ahead and look at the world that we're planning for. So this is Slovenia, right here. Um, it is between Austria, Hungary, Cro Croatia, and Italy. It's near the Gulf of Venice, but except for this little section right here, it's completely landlocked. There's a few lakes, um, Lake Bled. Uh, there's a few rivers. And I'm just gonna tell you right now, I don't speak a word of whichever languages they speak over here. So I'm going to butcher names and, and I just apologize for that. But it is probably one of the most scenic nations ever. Uh, here it is in the middle of winter. The trees are near dead and yet it's just gorgeous. A lot of the building style is these sort of light plasters with these bright red roofs. And this is what the tropical pack was built off of to try and replicate. It's got a little bit of a touch of like Austria, a little bit of Venice, those two things. So the European pack and the Twilight pack are going to be our bread and butter here. And it's just... Every single pe every single picture I've seen so far looks like a postcard. It's incredible. And this is this is one of those like you can probably tell from how many pictures it, it features, but this this castle right here on this lake is iconic. Um I think okay, bear with me. Does anybody remember Top Gear? Okay. And the guy who burned all the goodwill with the with the nation of Britain, I think. Um 
Okay, so either him or him and his buddies got picked up by Netflix. Anyway, so that that bunch, um, after they burned all their goodwill with ne- with uh, with the British people and got Top Gear canceled, um, I believe it was a Netflix or or maybe HBO. One of the big streaming services ended up picking them up, and they gave them a whole brand new show. And the whole thing is that they just go on these massive road trips. They pick their car and they go on these road trips, and there's always like a theme. And one time, they their goal was to get to this lake in Slovenia, and it was it was incredible the whole way. Really, like if you if you want to just like see what Slovenia is like and you don't hate them, it's worth a watch because it's very fun. I mean, otherwise, it's one of those like you would think it would be more featured, uh, but for the most part, it's not. I think it's it's mostly like. The tourism industry that that shows them off um, and a lot of the pictures that i'm pulling from right now a lot of these are brought to you by the state department <laughs> so i don't know if they're trying to advertise for for the traffic or what i don't know um but this seems like just a really nice place to build a zoo and it's very in line with the map that we're already going to be getting so this i'm again i have no idea where this is that they're building for um, because it doesn't look like anything i recognize but we're we've already got enough pieces in the game that we can quite easily build something like this so that is what i want to focus on so to that extent we are going to narrow down our animal list Uh, so i definitely want to include the possibility for all of the new eurasia pack animals just off the bat just period that's what i want and then, of course, I want to include some, but not all, of the animals that we already have in here. Like, we're not adding polar bears. I have built for polar bears so much in the last, like, two or three months. I'm a little done. If, if I don't have to build for a polar bear for another, like, year, I will be happy. Every impressed crest of porcupines, they're too far south, you know. Gray seals, wrong region. And uh, we're, we're down here somewhere. So it doesn't make sense to include them. Uh, same thing for reindeer. You you would think, but no, they're, they're actually too far north. So with all that faffing about, how do you plan a zoo? This is, this is why we pulled our animals already. So of the potential candidates, I have 15 possible candidates for this zoo. So obviously we've got the new Wizened Wild Boar uh, Mute Swan, which I want to do some kind of lake for that. We already know that that's going to be a thing. Um, which I don't know where we're going to put it, but this is nice flat land over here. So maybe we'll put like a lake over here. A sloth bear, which it feels like a sloth bear should go closer to the mountain. Saigas, saigas feel like they should be more in a grasslands area. Uh, Takins, Takins should go near the mountain as well. Um, Wolverines can be wherever they want. And then of course we've got the Eurasian lynx, badger, fallow deer, red deer, moose, red fox, timber wolf, and potentially the ibex. They're not really in the right region, but maybe we imported them. Next thing, uh, for this zoo, I'm not really planning a traditional zoo. Let's, let's be clear here, that's not what's happening. Normally, when you plan out a zoo, you plan you know, where you're going to have guest areas, where your entrance is going to be, things like that. I'm not going to do that uh, because it, even though we're going to have some similar features, it's not really going to make a lot of sense. So let's go ahead and get out our our painting tools, um, which I painted this over. Probably shouldn't have. So I want like a lake here, um, or at the very least, I want some kind of city park. But I would also like to have some kind of waterway that goes through here. And the problem with this terrain is figuring out how that's going to work, where we're going to build our city. So I kind of like the idea of having our main waterway come through here, just sort of cut through the landscape over in this direction and then land over here, which we are gonna get quite a good amount of terrain variation. And then off of this, I would like to build some kind of city that builds into this area right here where this park is. So that's kind of what I'm thinking for there. So this whole area, which I know I'm doing in short grass, so you're not going to be able to see it very well, but I will. You know, some kind of, of city thing. And then I think over here, I'd like a little bit more city. And then over here, some kind of natural thing. I know that I want the bears up here, as well as the taquin. And then from there, we sort of just go. But of course, with all of the planning that we're doing right now, what's the problem here? The problem is that I've not laid down a single building. 
and I've assigned myself an extreme workload just now. Because anytime that you talk about building a city, unless you're going to be drawing from your blueprints, let's, let's just go ahead and grab anything tagged Europe. So just pulling some buildings from the European DLC. Here's one shop, here's another random shop, and already we're getting a sense of scale of what this is going to be like. So I've assigned myself an incredible workload. Now there's a couple of ways to handle this. I mean, obviously the first one is to build yourself a set of modular buildings that you can adapt. That is the easiest thing to do. And it's what we're going to have to do if we want to replicate Slovenia, because thankfully, as we've been able to see from our pictures, the buildings mostly follow a similar pattern. We're gonna have this exact same red tiled roof. It's going to be in this sort of blocky city apartment style. There's going to be curves and we're gonna have streets to follow and things like that, but you know, for the most part, we can really build one section of an apartment and then layer it on top of itself. There'll be a couple of big feature things like whatever this building is, you know, if we wanted to build something like that, that would be a feature building. But the rest of these, we can we can do like one, maybe two apartments and then layer them. Number two, I don't know what the sizes for these animals are. I don't know what they're going to require. I can estimate based off of existing similar animals. For example, I'm not going to be surprised to find out that the Wizent is going to have the exact same requirements as the American Buffalo. Yeah, so I can expect that one animal is going to require 420 meters and then beyond that it's going to be an extra however much that is. 510 to 600, that's going to be like what, 90 meters? So I can estimate off of that for animals that we already have. You know, for the, the Wolverine, I expect it's probably going to be the same as the Badger. Sloth Bear. They're the only bear that has variation in its terrain, really, is the polar bear. So if we pull something closer to like the grizzly, it's probably going to require something similar, this 850. So all of these things I can kind of plan for. So that is one of the ways that you can start planning your, your zoo is to just figure out what you want, estimate where you want those things to go, and then plan yourself, usually with a paintbrush tool is what I recommend, areas where you want to start. But I will say, that when you do plan your zoo, it's important that you don't immediately get caught up in things like your entrance. It's, it's counterproductive at this phase. It doesn't matter what your entrance looks like, it matters where things are going to go. And even then, you're allowed to be flexible. You're, it, hmm, how do I put this? When you plan a project, there is what you think it's going to go like. And then once you actually get into the nitty gritty of the project, something always comes up. For example, I can say, I want my lake right here. I can go ahead and grab my terrain. I can start digging into the ground and then put some water and say, that's gonna be my lake. But I don't know where my buildings are gonna land me. I don't know if this is gonna be too much space or too little. I don't know what this park is gonna look like. And I can start here. I can say that this is my, my greatest anchor point and I can start here and then build off of it. But that means that any, any changes I make up here are going to radiate down the hill to whatever happens over here. It's just how it works. That's just project management. So have a plan, but but be flexible. You know, don't commit yourself to something and, and recognize, you know, don't commit yourself to something so, so much that by the time that you get there and it doesn't work that you feel like you've wasted all your time. It's just, it's not healthy and you're gonna abandon a lot of zoos that way. You're gonna abandon a lot of just life that way. Just don't do it. Number two, recognize what you're asking yourself to do and whether or not you're capable of doing it. You know, if, if you're one of those people who plays Planet Zoo two hours a week because you've got a family and a full-time job, what I've described here will probably maybe take you another five or six years of dedicated work. Whereas for me, I'm jobless and I, you know, don't have small children to care for. So this is something that's going to take me closer to like a month or two months because of the fact that I can no life this, you know. But that is a luxury I have that even then, I'm still asking myself to dedicate one to two months of nonstop working on this zoo in order to make it look the way that I want it to. Do I have that in me? No, I have crippling ADHD. Are you kidding? I've got crippling ADHD and I've got this channel to run. <laughs> So it's a massive amount of work and I, therefore I need to set my expectations properly that this is not going to happen overnight. And no matter how much work I do on it, it's not going to happen overnight. So those are, those are the two big hurdles in planning a zoo. But I want to show you something else because there, there's sort of this assumption that you need to plan out a zoo. 
And I'm gonna tell you right now, you don't actually need to do that. So let me load into a different game real quick. Okay, so we are in a completely different zoo now. Uh, this is Zoophilic Tier Park. It's it's not actually set in Germany, but I like to headcanon that it's it's set at least in that sort of region, somewhere in the Alps, you know, at the bare minimum. Maybe up north towards Finland. I don't really know and I don't really care. It's just Europe. <laughs> it's Europe somewhere. And I built this with the goal of using the Twilight Pack and building this kind of old, very medieval, very heavy style of building. And this was one of the only things that I could control about this map. I could control where things get placed and I can control what building style I'm using, but I can't control the animals. Because as the name would imply, if you have a little bit of German, this is a randomizer zoo. <laughs> Um, so literally what I've done is I've taken the names of every animal in game, I've put them into a picker wheel program, and every time I want to add a new animal, I have to spin that wheel. So I don't get a choice in what animal I get to add. I just have a choice in where I add them. And this is the zoo's, I want to say second or third iteration. Um, because of the fact that I don't get to pick what animals go where, I only get to choose because of the fact that I don't get to pick my animals, I just get to pick where to put them. When I get a new animal in game, sometimes it completely disrupted where I was putting the animals. Um, so I started in this little region right here, what's now the, the main entrance plaza. My entrance was right here, in this little thin line. And of course, this is now where my staff buildings and one of my habitats are, but you would come in through here and you'd be greeted with an entrance, a little food bank, there would be foxes, uh, to your left, there would be badgers. Over here, in this little area, there used to be skunks. Um, and then as the zoo continued to grow, and I got handed the curveball of hippopotamus as my th fourth animal to build for in the game, <laughs> it was it was not kind to me. Uh, but yeah, I got I got handed the the hippo as my fourth animal, and I was like, oh, okay. So I had to extend it all the way out here, and I had this massive lot. And as things just kept growing and growing, I decided, you know what? I need to rearrange. So I took what used to be my entrance over here, built myself a little hill, and put my entrance up here. And I got my little spawners in here. Built a custom entrance and then made sure that I had two exits. So there's an entrance, so there's a, an exit to the back, and there's an exit towards the main plaza over here to the front. And this main plaza is absolutely enormous, and part of it is paths. So you can see if I if I go over to to my paths, um, we're not quite working with with size tens, but these are like eights. These are enormous paths, and this was entirely to deal with congestion, because a lot of the animals that I was getting handed are really high appeal, highly popular animals. You know, I've got. Elephants over here, I've got bonobos over here, um, I've got arctic foxes over here. Um, eventually, we would get things like beavers, otters, um, and just recently, this is one of my latest annexes, we got hyenas. <laughs> so a lot of really high appeal animals. Um, I did a, a little bit of... Um, one of the one of the challenges and and one of the rewards was I, I got a whole bunch of I got a, a special gold red panda so I was like okay well I want to breed that so now we have red pandas in here and again you know it's entirely just taking what existed ripping it apart and rearranging it and then being mindful of my path sizes but this has led to some problems you know obviously so the first one is that if we go into any of these guests. And we're gonna we're gonna do a full you know tutorial about how the guests work. So starting off though, this this guest is a perfect example of it. So I've got striped hyena, Arctic fox, American alligator, Red River hog, and bonobo on their list. Now here's the problem. We already saw where the striped hyenas were. They're over there. Arctic foxes are in this little exhibit right here. Let's zoom out quite a bit. So striped hyena, Arctic fox. American alligator is up over here. Red River hog is in this habitat. Bonobo is over here. So that means that they're ideally 
going to go all the way through here. They're going to look around and then they might circle back over through here, come this way and look at the uh, striped hyenas before making their last animal, the Arctic fox, and then leaving the park. That would be the smart choice. Alternatively, they could go see the Arctic fox and then wrap around and go this circuit and then go home. That would make a lot of sense. That's not what guests actually do. And you can tell from the fact that she's going entirely the wrong direction, no matter how you slice it. So presumably she's going to come over here. She's going to stop and look at my penguins. And then she's going to go and stand probably right about here and look at my Red River hogs, be really disappointed in the view because she picked a bad place. And then she's going to turn around and go visit the Arctic foxes over here, get hungry and thirsty, and if we're lucky, she'll stop right here. Or she'll go over here. Or she'll go over here. And if we're really lucky, she'll go see her hyenas. I spent a good hour or two just tracking the progress of a guest throughout this zoo. And it was a lot of crossing over here, then going over here, then going over here, then going over here, then going over here, going over here and then going over here, and then getting frustrated and then leaving. This is something that I could have planned better if I understood how the guest AI were going to just completely botch this setup. But we didn't really have that kind of control. So instead, the zoo is broken up into a more traditional this whole area is going to be our like African wetlands hot area. Over here is sort of our American tundra cold area, except for this little habitat, because it made more sense to put them over here. We've got meerkats. Yeah, ideally we should have put them over here, but, but where? We've got this wall, so we'd have to keep expanding in this direction or put them over here. And yeah, that would have made sense if I wanted to keep with this theme, but I wanted to keep with this build theme and I wanted to expand this area because it was a little bit, it was a sad little appendix and I wanted more. So that's part of the problem. You know, another part of the problem is that I can plan for all of these regions, but I've got a spinner wheel that I have to it, it, just spin and hope that it gives me something I can use. And it's not necessarily going to play nice. So instead of trying to plan around a whole, a whole bunch of just unknown impossible variables, I plan around what I can control, which is my guest areas, where I want parks, where I want space, um, where I want the terrain to be, what kind of variation and themes. You know, this is honestly this area right here. This is one of my favorite habitats I've ever built because it's just pretty, you know, it, it feels like something out of a nature park and I'm happy with it. But if you have a rough understanding of how to control congestion and you don't mind the guests staying here for years upon years upon years, which, you know, depending on your computer, you may want because the longer a guest stays, the more they pull from the ATM, the fewer guests you actually need to have. You know, I'm sitting nice at 741 with one of the most expensive build kits I've ever used. And I've got a lock that says that I can't have more than 2,500 guests because that's all my computer can handle. But we're doing really good, you know? I'm not wanting for money. I'm making, I'm making a good amount of cash. So to a certain extent, the planning doesn't actually matter. Um, and in a lot of ways, not planning can actually make your zoo feel A, more organic, and B, let you adapt to whatever you're handling a lot better than if you had some kind of dream, you know. There was no way that I was ever going to dream this up and build it. I got handed a, a set list and was told good luck. And within those constraints, suddenly ideas start to happen. You know, if you have an infinite blank space, you sort of have every possibility and your brain starts to shut down because it's too much. But if you have parameters that you have to obey, suddenly you now have a whole bunch of possibilities that you can actually act upon. And it gets rid of a lot of that frustration and indecision. You know, anytime that I get frustrated with trying to decide what to do, you know, as far as the greenery in my park goes next, I go to my spinner wheel and I get another animal and immediately I know what I have to do. If I decide that, you know, an area of my park really doesn't look good, you know, I can, I can look at this little section right here and say, wow, this really needs some love and then just work on that for a little while. And even though it's slow incremental process, eventually you get something really cool. So 
that is planning a zoo. Um, next time when we come back, hopefully I will have more of the Slovenian park to actually show you. And then we can talk about adapting our plans to the realities that we actually have. Hope this was a little bit useful. Um, I know that this is one of those really difficult topics for a lot of people. You know, you get these wonderful ideas in your head and then you sit down and it's like everything just flies out of your, out of your mind. So hopefully this helps. Um, thank you for joining me. Happy building and I will see you next time. Thank you.